All right, welcome to our first virtual meetup of 2020. I am so excited to welcome Docker Captain, Microsoft MVP, and DevOps engineer at the Hoffa Group, Nicholas Dealey, and he will be sharing how to improve your Docker image build builds today. So as you have questions, please go ahead and type them uh, in the chat or there's a Q&A feature and we will stop and try to answer those as we go along. Um, and there should also be time for questions at the end. Uh, Nicholas, please take it over. All right, thanks a lot, Jenny. Thanks for the warm um, um, introduction and I'm really happy to be here. Warm welcome to everyone. I see lots of people from all over the world um, uh, so it's really great to be here and uh, yeah, like I said, I'm happy to be able to have this virtual meetup with Docker and Jenny. Um, so you, you guys are really uh, fortunate because uh, I caught a bit of a cold and uh, I'm probably coughing a bit. So uh, in the virtual meetup, you won't catch anything from me. So uh, that's a big pro on your side. Um, okay, so I prepared some slides and demos, uh, how to improve your Docker image builds. Um, no, this will not be another um, how to write a perfect Docker file. Um, I've seen that a lot and there's uh, lots of great content out there. So I've decided to um, present you a lot of features that are now available in uh, Docker CLI and a few tools around that. But before we kick it off, um, a few more words to myself. Um, I do this kind of stuff a lot. So webinars, talks and uh, workshops. And I've been doing this for, for lots of years and it's always been fun, so I'm happy to do this now. But let's not, let's not talk about me, let's talk about the content. So what I'd like to cover with you is um, I'd like to kick this off with a short overview of the build engine flavors that uh, Docker is providing us in the CLI and then dive into um, build kits to look at build secrets, um, how to handle them, how to prevent uh, typical mistakes. Um, I'll touch on testing images um, because, you know, like software, you never know if it's really going to work um, until you tested it properly. We touch scanning of images because uh, security is a really, really hot topic now. And uh, we all certainly, wa certainly want to avoid to uh, catch uh, malware or to, uh, to open ourselves up to some kind of attacks. We'll also look at uh, multi-architecture images and um, in the end, I'll share a few tricks and tips that um, I just thought uh, you should not miss. Although it's not really um, something that belongs to image builds, it's still something that, um, well, you just have to listen to this. And um, as always, I think that uh, demos are more important than slides. So um, let's all hope the demo gods are with me. Uh, I've got lots of live demos and um, yeah, let's see how that goes. Um, yeah, at the end, you'll um, get a QR code to uh, get to the slides, but uh, you also see a blog post about this uh, on the Docker blog. So um, no need to look at them immediately. You can look at all of this later on. Okay, so uh, let's get started. So um, the Docker CLI that we all have on our machines comes with two build engines at the moment. So we have, we have the legacy build engine that we all have come to love, um, which is the default when you run Docker build. And it has been around for ages, since the early days. And uh, it's the typical uh, um, output of step-by-step uh, -step with the output of the commands that you run. But, um, well, a lot of time ago, actually about two years ago, um, Docker has introduced um, BuildKit in the Docker CLI, uh, which is based on the, on the mobile project called BuildKit. And um, although it's there, it's not enabled by default. So if you want to uh, take a look at the um, build kit features, you need to have an environment variable, which is called docker underscore build kit. And if you set that to one, it will enable the build kit integration and you'll get uh, lots of fancy features. And um, that's what I'll focus about in the first part of this virtual meetup. And um, if you wonder why build kit it was integrated, um, it's just more flexible, it's faster, and um, as you'll see, has cool features. So um, as before, um, Jenny said that uh, you can ask questions. Uh, you can do that anytime you want. Um, we already got one question in the loop, so want to know um, Docker image security. Like I said, that's something I'll touch on to scan images for known vulnerabilities. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, so if you have 
Any additional questions to what I'll show you in a few minutes, then I'll just pose the question. <clears throat> okay, so the first thing that uh, probably a lot of you have already seen is multi-stage builds. And I think there's two aspects to multi-stage builds that uh, we need to look at. The first thing is separation. So the um, typical question is that, um, the typical um, issue is that if you build an image, um, you may have um, something like, let's say if we have Java, we have a Java um, program and you don't want it to end up with a JDK in the final image. So what multi-stage builds gives you is you can build the uh, image or you can, you can um, build your application using the JDK and then build the final image based on the JRE. Um, let's take a quick look at that. <clears throat> so we have a few demos here. So <clears throat> um, if you use the uh, multi-stage build feature to build an image, um, you use the normal syntax and um, what happens is that, as always, um, at first the image gets pulled, which is the JDK image. And um, as soon as that is pulled, it will compile the Java program, which is just a very simple hello world. And um, afterwards, the compiled Java program will be added to an JRE image, which is, has a, a very small attack surface compared to the JDK. And in the end, <coughs> you just have the JRE image with a Java program. Um, at this point, it's also very nice to look at the different output of the um, Docker build commands. So at the, at the top, what you've seen so far is the classical output, so the output of the legacy build engine. If you do the same thing, if you do the same thing with build kit, you get a different output, which is a bit more condensed, so, um, and it has, uh, well, all the nice colors, right? So uh, you get a uh, white output for stuff that's currently happening and you get blue output for stuff that has been finished. <clears throat> so, and what you see in, uh, in those here, let's say, let's take a look at the top one. Um, at the top here, you see the first part of the image build where the Java file is copied into the image. Then you see the, Compilation of the image, and then the second part, which is step four to six, um, the JRE version of the J Open JDK image is pulled, and the final class file is added. Um, I saw a question about the demos. Um, the demos um, are well; they belong to the slides, so they will be shared with the slides. Um, I've also incorporated them on the slides. Let me switch back to this. So if you look at this feature and you go down in the slides, you get the commands that I've run. <clears throat> we had okay. two other questions. First question okay. from Leaf. Is there any reason for a new project to not just always use the new build kit over legacy? I think there's actually no reason to use the legacy build engine uh, at all. So I would really love to see this to be the default build engine. Um, so there's no need to fiddle around with the uh, environment variable anymore and just have the build kit engine enabled by default. Okay, and then we had another question. Would build kit use the cache of the classic version? Uh, no, it has a separate cache. Um, we get to the build cache uh, in two, maximum three slides, um, but it is a separate cache. All right. And we also have another question. Is it good practice to copy source code, Hello World Java and compile inside the container? Um, I usually love to do um, builds inside the container because I control the environment. I have this um, um, prepared image I can use for building or I can prepare the, the build environment myself. And um, because the, in the multi-stage build, the source code is not copied from the intermediate image to the final image, you only have the um, class file in the final image and the source code, let's say, just goes away with the intermediate image. Okay. And then one more, does multi-stage feature allow two images running in a single container? 
two images running in a similar con in the same container. Um, well, the, the build engine does uh, works the same way as the legacy build engine. So there's 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 no um, inherent way to run more than one command at a time. But of course, you can use the run command in a Docker file to do more than one thing by uh, putting one thing in the background and doing something else in one run command. But um, I think that's a very special use case, um, which would be really interesting to talk about a bit more, but um, it's probably, uh, well, not the best situation right now. Yeah. All right, why don't you continue on and then we'll break if we get more. Okay. <clears throat> so like I said, separation is one of the uh, very important features of the multi-stage build. Um, the second one is concurrency. And um, the nice thing is that um, the individual stages of your multi-stage build can be built in parallel. And um, this all works on a dependency graph that BuildKit creates before starting the build. And um, the example that you see on the screen right now um, shows two intermediate images called build one and build two, which have uh, no dependencies between them and uh, they don't depend on anything else except for the upstream Alpine image. And the final image, which is called final, um, copies things from the intermediate images called build one and build two. So what happens here is that build one and build two will run at the same time and the final image will then be built as the last step. Let's take a look at this. Let's jump over to the second demo. Oh, that's of course concurrency. Um, so if we use that Docker file that I just showed you and do a build with a legacy build engine, it will work sequentially. So um, one thing you'll see is that I put a run sleep in there, which waits for 10 seconds. And I put that into both of the intermediate images. So what will happen is that in the sequential version, so with a legacy build engine, the build will take at least 20 seconds because it has to sleep 10 seconds twice once for every intermediate image. <clears throat> so in, this, uh, in, the, in the second example, if you enable build kit and do the same, you'll see that the intermediate images will be built at the same time. And um, that's right here. You see that build one and build two are run at the same time and it will only take 10 seconds once to finish that command. And the overall build time is just uh, 12.1 seconds. Um, which also, also shows that it must have run in parallel because there's no way this could have finished in 10 seconds if it had run two sleep commands after another. Okay. <clears throat> um, now, um, we had this question about build cache earlier. And um, one thing with caches is that um, you need a, a cache warming to really use them. So if you're doing Docker builds on a single machine, um, your cache warming is the very first build that you do. So after the first build, every consecutive build will be able to use the cache and will probably have faster image builds. Um, if you have um, a larger environment like we do at Haufe, where you have um, dozens of different build agents, your build may end up on any one of them. And it may end up on a machine that has never seen one of your builds before. So there is no cache. And there's a nice way to warm your cache in the legacy build engine by pulling the image version that you built previously. So as you can see in this example, if you do a Docker pull of the previous version, um, you can then do a Docker build with a cache from, which says use the, or fill the build cache based on the previous image version and then do the build. Um, this is really nice, but uh, you really have you have to pull the previous image um, as a whole. So um, you have to pull all of it, which may be quite a large download. So what Docker did in the build kit integration, there's a much easier way to get your cache warming because uh, to get your cache warmed, because you can simply um, reference an image that is present in your registry, and build kit will take care of downloading the correct layers. So I hope you all know that images are made up of layers and um, that probably the first few layers of your build will stay the same. So um, 
there's no need to download all of the image, but it will just download parts of the image which uh, help you to speed up the consecutive build. Um, let's look at this in a quick demo. <clears throat> Oh, there's a question. How does putting the previous image save time over just doing the build? So um, if you build um, a nice Docker file, then you usually you put stuff at the bottom, at the top, that, cha that changes very rarely. So for example, if you're um, currently working on one image, you would put your um, apt update and apt install at the top, because that will not, that will not change very often. It will probably change daily, but uh, if you're working on an image, you probably do um, a few or dozen uh, builds after another, and uh, then it will help you because um, it will always give you the same result. So, um, and we had a few other questions. If you are ready, of course. Does Docker Compose support Build Kit? What are your thoughts on having the testing step as a stage in a multi-stage build? For instance, running PyLint and PyTest for a Python app in an intermediate step. Um, so uh, Docker Compose and BuildKit, I must say I'm not sure. I haven't tried this before, but that's mainly because um, I'm very rarely using Docker Compose, so I'm mostly using um, Docker build with BuildKit integration, and um, next step is is a deployment, which in our case is based on Kubernetes. So, you know, I'll um, I'll find an answer to that question, and I'll add it to um, the to the slides, so you can look at that afterwards and um, get the question from the slides. Okay. And the second one was the test stage in the multi-stage build. Um, it, it is a very good idea to do the test in a multi-stage build if you um, have nothing like a CI/CD environment or a CI/CD server. But as soon as your multi-stage build gets more complex, you may have to think about um, doing a proper CI/CD where the individual stages are, uh, well, the typical stages like there's a build stage for compiling the program, there's a test stage for testing it, and then there's some kind of package stage to, to package it into the final Docker image. And there may also be a scan step to uh, make sure that you don't have any vulnerabilities. And then uh, just to add, in the last release, Docker Compose does support BuildKit. Awesome. So I'll make sure to add that to the slides um, so the question doesn't have to come up again next time. All right, perfect. <clears throat> uh, and then let's see, our next question is, oh, Shane was sharing that the Docker DIMD, what's that image? Uh, Docker and Docker, yeah. Docker and Docker image should be used uh, for running multiple images in a single container. So I think he was answering the previous question. Okay. And then so, uh, another question is, is the created image still identical or are there any real difference in the final image artifact? So I assume that means if you do consecutive builds, um, I'm not sure I really get the question. Um, so Bjorn, can you, can you um, write a bit more about what, what you actually mean with that question, and I'll, I'll circle back to that later, okay? Thanks. <coughs> okay, um, now, demo time. Um, if we look at the um, build kit way to warm the cache, there's, um, uh, the, so the first thing you always have to do is uh, enable build kit in Docker. That's the first step. And then there's, a special thing you need to do in BuildKit to um, prepare BuildKit for the cache. So you have to add a special build argument, um, which is called BuildKit inline cache equals one. And this will tell BuildKit to compile information about the cache and embed it into the image. And the idea is that when the image is built, that cache information is inside the image manifest and then uploaded to the registry. So when you do the consecutive build, the 
um, BuildKit will be able to download the image manifest, look up the cache information, and then decide which layers of the older image to pull. Now, um, not very surprising. Um, this is again building my Java application. So, I'm, by the way, I'm not a developer, so the only thing I'm able to do is a hello world in Java, and that's what I'm always using for my demos because um, that's as much of a high level language I can write. Um, so, what you'll see at the end, you see here exporting cache and preparing build cache for export. And then in the push, the build cache is pushed to the registry. Um, and it's just transparent. So, if you add the build argument, this, um, it's just embedded uh, transparently and pushed um, to the registry without anything else you need to do. And in the what I'm now doing is I'm doing a Docker system prune, so I'm removing everything from this Docker daemon. And uh, <laughs> based on the image, I just push to the registry. And what we see at the top, let's see here, importing cache manifest from localhost 5000 test colon one. So, the build kit actually tells you that it's uh, importing the manifest. And uh, one question that usually comes up, um, if the image does not exist, so if it's the very first image you build, or um, the, all the image builds before that have failed, um, build kit will not die on you, it will not uh, throw an error, it will just silently um, accept that the image is not there and will continue with a full build um, to create the first cache information in the first image. Okay, let's jump back to the slides. <clears throat> um, so next uh, very important thing about uh, BuildKit is uh, build secrets. So um, what we've done in the past is we provide build secrets in environment variables. Um, the problem with that is that using an env, so an environment variable in the image, um, means that the value is burned into the image. So the worst thing you can do is using env, an environment variable, for uh, secrets. Build arguments are nice, but actually meant for yeah, passing arguments that are need for the build, like versions. But if you're trying to use secrets, then BuildKit has a nice new feature because you can tell it to mount secrets using a tempfs, so a temporary file system that just lives uh, in memory and is, mount is mounted to slash root slash secrets. Uh, let's take a look at this and jump into the next demo. Oh, so uh, Bjorn has uh, written a few lines about his earlier question. So, so the question is, if there's a difference in functional size if I build the image using a legacy build engine or build kit. Uh, so function size is the same, but uh, build kit is actually faster, not only because it is able to do things in parallel, um, it's just more optimized and um, helps you to be a lot faster. There's some uh, nice uh, things that uh, Docker has published um, when building the Moby build kit uh, repository and uh, maybe we can look that up Jenny and uh, send that out or mention it in the blog post afterwards just to give people a, um, an idea that build kit is not just a fancy new way of doing stuff but also it's uh, faster and more efficient. Sounds good. Uh, so this is the, uh, still the build cache demo so build secrets and um, one thing you, you often want to do is you want to mount something into um, an image. Let's say you have um, um, some kind of um, some kind of secret that you need during the installation of, of a tool. And um, <clears throat> what you do is there's two things to it. So as always, activate build kit. The second thing is you tell it that there's something you want to mount, some secret that you have that you need in your image. So you give it an ID, which is a name to identify the secret, and tell it where to take the secret from. So it can be a local file. And um, this, um, the secret is then embedded into the build process. Let me quickly jump back to the slides to show you that. There's a special sy syntax for that. So you have to add a comment at the top of the Docker file to tell BuildKit that it has to use um, an experimental syntax. 
And then you have a parameter for the mount command, which tells BuildKit uh, that you need a mount of the type secret and you reference the ID that you mention uh, when running your build. So the thing that I've added here to the build command. And I've written the build in a way that you see the difference. So um, I'll show you the output of a disk free. So for example, at the top here, this run command is using the dash dash mount parameter and uh, it shows the secret in a temp fs right here. So, and if I then do a second run command without the double dash mount parameter, um, there's no secrets um, that is mounted into this second run command. So you can mount the secrets into the run command that requires the secret, but you can leave it out for other run commands that do not require the secret. And that's a very nice way to, to um, provide secrets to a build without using uh, build arguments or without copying files into the image, which is, which is always a very bad idea. So, but there's more to it. So um, sometimes we need to go out to another system to do something. And um, what BuildKit has introduced, um, or what, what Docker has integrated into version 18.09, uh, which has been available since then, is the ability to forward the local SSH agent into the image build. And the worst thing that you can do is uh, what I've shown you on the, on the slide. So it's actually something that I found um, at, uh, at the place where I work. And uh, there was an Ubuntu image and someone thought that they need to copy something from um, a remote server. And the first step to, to do was copy the um, SSH private key into the image. Now, that command will create a new layer with the private key, which will stay in the final image. Then there's the run command using that um, private key, and then a final stage to remove that. So in, in the end, the final image will look like the private key is actually gone, but the copy command has created one layer which contains the private key, and this will not go away by executing the run command at the bottom. So never do this because what you do, you expose an SSH private key and you also provide a user and host name to use that private key for. So never do that. But instead, do what I'll show you. <coughs> um, oops, demo. So we have this SSH agent demo. So we'll start off with preparing a new SSH key. Uh, second step will then be to start an S the SSH agent, add the key, and make sure we have the key added to the agent. Let's do that. And uh, now all of you, please remember this uh, easy to, re to remember um, string because it identifies the SSH key. We'll see that a bit later. I need to compare it to make sure that it's the same one. And the Docker file, <coughs> looks a bit similar to mounting a secret as a file because a run command can have a mount parameter of type SSH. And type SSH means that it will mount the SSH agent socket into this single build step. So I'll do the build and again, we'll have the output of mounting SSH and, mounting and not mounting it. So um, at the top here, this one here shows the output of running the mount command with the agent socket mounted. And we'll see from a print env that the variable SSH agent socket is available. And um, then we'll see the ID of the key that we added. And we have a second print env that has not mounted the SSH agent socket and there's nothing with regard to SSH. So um, to make this easy to compare, I've added another test on the local machine um, to show the ID of the key and it is, is the same as the one up here in the image. So it has really worked. It has really mounted my private, the, the, the SSH connection, the connection to the SSH agent into the image uh, without actually copying the 
SSH private key into the image. Okay, next topic, um, testing images. So um, there's one tool that I found that I find very easy to use, which is called GOSS. It's a tool that, well, for validating a configuration. Um, I think it's easier than server spec, but well, you may have a different opinion. Um, it's, it expresses the configuration in YAML. It has support for containers and uh, different output formats. Um, and what it can do is you can, um, for example, you do a multi-stage build and you integrate the GOSS binary into the image, test it in a separate stage. That's a bit similar to what uh, someone asked earlier. So um, let's look at the, um, the, the GOSS demo. <clears throat> so there's a really nice way to use this for, um, for Docker. And um, so there's a wrapper around GOSS, which is called DGOSS, Docker GOSS. And now tell it to um, edit the, um, the tests for Nginx. And, um, ooh, the horror. Ooh, I haven't installed DGOS. Well, that's, that's a boo-boo, isn't it? So um, let me jump over to the slides because we can look at this <coughs> in here. Um, so if you do what I earlier showed you, the DGOS edit Nginx, um, you can, why do I have this? Let me quickly check. Oh yeah, yeah, right here. So you can run a GOS auto add Nginx and it will go through all the providers it knows and check if there's something called Nginx. So it will, it will find a user called Nginx. It will find a service called Nginx. Um, it will call, find um, a process called Nginx and so on and so on and will add, automatically add tests related to those names. And um, let's take a look at, oops. And you will end up with a um, definition that tells GOS there's a package called Nginx, which is installed and which has a very a certain version. There's a port listening on all IP addresses. There's a service enabled and running. There's a user with a certain ID and so on, so on. And you can then run this test against an image with DGOS run, which will give you an overview, which you probably all know, which is very similar to what your unit tests will show. And um, DGOS run will output this and tell you whether all the tests have um, succeeded successfully or if something failed. So you can make sure that the image matches the specification that you created earlier. Okay, so um, um, what GOS can also do is you can use it to embed a health endpoint into a container. Well, of course, this, this requires a bit more work because a health endpoint is something that runs next to the processes inside your container. So you have to think about uh, proper entry points that, uh, that manages starting all the, uh, the process that you need, like in this case, an engine X, or you need to, to start the, the health service um, integrated into GOS. <coughs> and um, what this means, you probably need some kind of, of init process that also takes care of signaling, which is a very important thing if you have more than one process in a container. So uh, let's, since the, the GOS tests don't really work, uh, let's quickly look at um, the healthy Docker file. <clears throat> so what I've done here is um, I'm doing a multi-stage build uh, based, the first stage is simply telling Docker that I want this image, this GOS image um, under the name of GOS. And then I'm creating the Nginx image, copying in the GOS binary, copying in the definition. And then what I often use is supervisor to start more than one process. And um, this copies all the necessary configuration files for supervisor as well as, as the different processes. So 
there's one configuration for starting Nginx, there's one configuration for starting GOS with the health endpoint, and all of that gives you a container that will um, periodi periodically publish health information on the health endpoint. So yeah, I'm really sorry that the um, demo didn't work. I, I could now start fiddling and installing DGOS, but um, I think you get the idea how this works and you can always uh, uh, look up the commands from the slides as well as the demos uh, in the repository where the slides live. So you'll find the link to the, to the demos and uh, will be able to play with this yourself. And yes, to Kim, the video will be shared along with all the materials. Um, Okay, uh, we have a few questions. Did you want to get to some of those or okay. keep going? Um, will Docker inspect show that the image was built using BuildKit? Uh, no, it will not. Okay. Um, then there is a conversation where people are answering each other's questions. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> um, that makes our job easier. Right, and then there's comments that some of the Docker commands maybe are providing an error. Um, so we can take a look at that after. I assume that's for your demo, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, you're probably referring to uh, this Docker pull Alpine SSH latest, right? Yep. <clears throat> yeah, so if you tried that um, on your machine right now, that's, uh, that's not going to work because um, uh, that's an image I pre-built. Um, as you've probably seen, I've, I've, my demo, I've automated my demos to be able to talk about what I'm doing instead of writing commands because you're not here to watch me write a Docker command. Um, so I'd rather explain what's happening on the console. And um, all those demos have a preparation step. And one, in, in that specific demo, uh, one of the preparation steps was to create a local image called alpine-ssh. So that's why you're not able to pull this uh, from the uh, Docker Hub. <clears throat> but there's also stuff that's available um, in the repository where the slides live. And you get a pointer to that. Okay. Um, and then let's see. Uh, we have the question, is there any meaning to the build kit caching when not using registry? So if you're building an image and not pushing it to a registry, well, then, then you have only local builds. And uh, of course, then you have the local build cache. So there's, um, there's no need to, uh, uh, if you don't push the image to a registry, you just use local build cache, which is just fine if that's what you want to do. Great. And then any pointers on how to enable build kit for Jenkins Docker build plugin? And if we don't have that now, we can always come back to that. Yeah, um, well, since um, I, I don't know how the plugin works um, underneath. If it just calls Docker build, so if it just spawns the, the Docker um, Docker based process, um, maybe it it will work just to um, export the environment variable Docker underscore build kit equals one. And then, do you know any combination of debugging with Docker images? containers. I use the following technologies, Python, Django, and PyCharm. Well, that, that is rather well specific concerning the technologies and uh, a bit vague about the debugging tools. Um, well, I, I do get to um, troubleshooting later, but um, I think if you mean debugging as in um, debugging a program that you're currently writing, uh, no. Like I said earlier, I'm, I'm not a developer, so um, I usually focus on uh, operations and um, improving operations. So I can unfortunately not say anything about debugging a program. All right, Christian, I will ask around and see if I can come up with an answer for that. We have one more. Uh, is Docker Build Kit supported with Maven Dockerfile plugin? I oh, also cannot answer that. I don't know. Okay, I'll try to find out. Carry on. And, <laughs> cool, uh... thanks. Okay, so um, uh, next important thing, after we've done our tests and we're fairly sure that the image works um, or has come out as we expected it, um, a very important topic at the moment is security. 
So what we all learned from, uh, from recent exposures is that um, yes, the security issues will be discovered and your images will be affected by them. Um, there's no way around this. So the best way to handle this is to rebuild your image re images regularly, um, scan your images and your dependencies, and of course, deploy them regularly. It doesn't help if you rebuild if you, if you don't deploy them. So for example, for us, we usually uh, um, build and deploy a QA stage uh, on a daily basis or if something changes, and then we uh, do a weekly rollout uh, to make sure that we have the latest image running um, for our services. Um, even if there's no change in the service itself, so no update to, let's say, uh, Jenkins, Jira, whatever, but um, we just want the latest uh, libraries, latest dependencies uh, inside the image. And there's one really nice tool that makes uh, scanning images really easy, which is Trivi, which is made by, by Aqua Security, because, um, uh, well, it is limited to, uh, to Docker images, but it covers the OS. Um, as well as uh, um, the most prominent package managers. Let's have a quick look at this. Jump into the Trivi demo. <coughs> so um, I've preloaded the Trivi database because that takes some time to load. So and <coughs> if that, that's one command that um, makes a lot of sense for Trivi because um, the first thing is you don't want to update the database every time you run Trivi because that may take quite some time and you usually want your scan to be really fast because then you have a quick turnaround. If you find a vulnerability, you can fix it, you can rebuild, rescan and make sure that it is fixed. I usually also ignore unfixed vulnerabilities because right now there's nothing I can do about it. But if you want to be more strict about this, you can remove this and you will also get errors about uh, unfixed vulnerabilities which will then break your build and uh, force you to wait for a fix. And I also add the exit code one <coughs> because um, I want Trivi to fail if it finds a vulnerability and I want my CI CD pipeline to fail if there is a vulnerability. And I like to limit this to high and critical vulnerabilities. Um, yeah, because it's the, the most important thing to get those out of your images. And for this demo, I um, I looked up one image that will, of course, show us a few uh, vulnerabilities because it would be really, really boring if I show you an image scan which doesn't output anything. So, for example, this image will give you um, which library is affected, the CVE ID um, to look this up, the severity, the installed version, and of course, the fixed version. So, you know what to update, and a very small uh, subscription. So, it's the title of the CVE. <clears throat> um, like I said, I, I really like Trivi because it's a, a small tool, it's uh, very fast and it's um, yeah, very easy to get into. So the, um, it gets you an image scan very quickly, which um, allows you to, like I said earlier, have a very quick turnaround to make sure that um, you still have your mind on this image build when fixing the vulnerability. Okay, uh, multi-architecture images. Mm. This is, I'd say, a niche case or niche use case, but um, nevertheless, it's some, some really cool stuff. <clears throat> so um, what Docker has implemented in the past um, with heavy work from Docker Cap to Philestis <clears throat> um, is the ability to have one image name which works on different platforms. And um, the official images that are available on Docker Hub are all converted to multi-architecture images. So I have a few examples on the slides. For example, if you look at OpenJDK, there's um, one image that will scan the image you provide as a parameter and show you which plat platforms the image is supported on. And so for example, the OpenJDK 8 JDK image <coughs> will work with the same name, the exact same name on uh, Linux and on different platforms of Windows containers. Um, and if you use a specialized image like the JDK Nano Server, which is a Windows image, it will of course only output which image version, versions this runs on. <clears throat> um, by the way, very nice. Um, 
uh, if you do the quick start um, on the, uh, the quick start tutorial that Docker um, provides, uh, the hello world is something that Docker apparently wants to run on almost every platform that you run Docker on. So if you look at the platform supported by this image, you get a long list of the different Linux platforms as well as the different Windows platforms supported by Docker. <laughs> so um, let's dive into actually building an image for different architectures. And um, so what I've prepared is a build X demo because the command to do this is called build X. <clears throat> which is a Docker CLI plugin, which you can install on your local machine. And the way that BuildX works is, um, the first thing that you need to do is enable the experimental features in your Docker client. <clears throat> and then you need to call this obscure image, which in the end tells Linux kernel, if there's a binary format, which is the, um, bin FMT is the abbrevi abbreviation for binary format. <clears throat> if it finds a binary format that doesn't match the current architecture, it will use uh, um, QEMO to emulate a machine running that arch architecture. So first thing we do is we enable this feature. And <clears throat> then we tell build X that we have a specific builder. And so we, we let it create a new builder um, with the name my builder, and we tell it to start using that builder. And then we inspect it <clears throat> to see what the features of this new builder are. Let's quickly take a look at them. <clears throat> and what you'll now see is this is the output of the build X create. And um, what it actually does is it downloads a build kit container and starts that. So under the hood, build X is just, well, it's just uh, a build kit container, which is then able to run on this long list of different platforms. <clears throat> so what we now do is uh, we do a small hack. I'll not go into details for that. And then we have the build X build command. And we now tell it to build in the local directory and to build for several platforms. So we tell it to um, build for ARM, ARM64, and AMD64. And to publish all of them under one single name. <clears throat> and now, if we do that, we see a build kit running. And we again see that it's doing several things at once. So we have here an ARM v7, an ARM64. And in between, we saw the AMD64 build. So it's actually building all those images in parallel because there's no dependencies between those images and then um, exporting the image and pushing them to the registry. And if we now do an inspect with the build X command of this new image, uh, we get the so-called so manifest list. And the manifest list tells the Docker client that there's different ways um, to provide this image. One asks, for this exact name and does that from a Linux ARM machine. Docker will automatically pull this specific image in the background and use it to run. So um, in our case, if we ask for um, the AMD64 image, we get the one at the bottom. So um, it's all built in parallel. It's pushed as one single image and um, you can use that single name on different platforms and uh, of course get similar results from that. Let me quickly look at the slides because I thought I had a run command. No, no unfortunately not. So um, that way you can actually cross build images on your typical Linux machine, which is usually AMD64, and publish those images, uh, let's say, for your Raspberry Pi without doing the build on your Raspberry Pi or a um, compatible platform. And that's a really, really neat feature to be able to build for other platforms uh, without leaving your typical development environment. Okay, 
Um, I've added some more demos in the slides, which I probably have to skip because of time and there's other um, exciting stuff. Um, because I mentioned at the top that, um, that Phil Estes has created the a Docker manifest tool, which is now integrated into the Docker CLI. And um, there's, it gives you more control over um, building the image. So for example, if you do separate builds of your images for the different platforms, like so, um, you can then um, merge them into a single image on your own. So then you have the individual images with, um, with the platform in the name, as well as um, being able to push them with a single name on the different platforms. Okay, um, any more questions we uh, should cover now, Jenny? Uh, we do have a few questions and um, let me see. One of them was about, we said we were going to get back to them. Uh, which I'm looking at. The Maven Dockerfile plugin. There is someone like experimenting with that and working on that, but I, we don't, I don't know for sure if uh, it works or not. Then we have... Off topic, what terminal app are you using for Windows? <laughs> well, yeah, it's uh, WSL2 I'm using in the background and um, uh, it's uh, open WSL. All right, but then we have- There's, there's several. Uh, is Docker Build Kit fully backward compatible with legacy Docker Build, like all the parameters? Yes. Uh, very easy, very short answer, yes. Good. I will add that to the questions. Does BillKit work on OS? OS? On OS? Is that, is that, uh, OS X, is that the 10 operating oh. system for Mac? Oh, OS X, okay, I just, I just heard OS, so I was wondering which OS. Um, yeah, it does. So like, like you, as, as, as you've seen uh, in the last demo, um, when running build X, it, it starts a build kit container in the background. You can also run build kit uh, locally. Um, it's it's a, just a normal Linux binary and uh, you could just run it as any other process. All right, I think we are good. Are there any other questions? Or anything else you want to cover? We have about four more minutes, and yeah, like yeah, said, we will share all of this, and uh, Nicholas will write out a blog post as well. Yeah, let, let me try to to cover the the, the remaining slides and uh, go quickly through them, because um, yeah, I'll jump over the demo for that because um, uh, there's a new sub command called Docker Context, which gives you the, a way to manage multiple instances of Docker. So um, it's, it's a bit like Docker machine without deploying anything, um, but it gives you a nice way to uh, target different remote Docker engines. So just as a heads up, heads up that um, it's out there. Um, so uh, troubleshooting, let me quickly uh, show you this. Um, one thing that uh, you, will of, you probably often come across is that uh, you build a minimal image, there's hardly anything in it and, and um, but you do have a shell, but you consider the container immutable. So you don't want to go in for troubleshooting and start installing dozens of tools just to figure out what's going on. Um, a way to go about this is to create a second container which shares the network and PID namespace. So in that case, it will um, the, the second container will feel just like running inside the other container. So um, like this, let's say you have a very simple Nginx container running and there's something weird going on and you don't want to install anything in that container. And um, in the second command, we have those two special parameters. So we run some kind of image, for example, Alpine, and we tell it to share the network namespace with a container called Nginx and the PID namespace with the same container. And um, the second container will be able to see 
all processes of both containers and have the same network layer as the first container. Really nice for troubleshooting. Um, so you'll be able to uh, check everything without changing the first container. Um, so if you're wondering um, why would I use Alpine, um, there's nothing installed in there. Um, there's a really cool project by Docker captain Lukas Lach. And um, he has introduced a registry which will provide you with an Alpine based image containing all the tools that you specified for this um, registry. So for example, if you pull from cmd.cat slash curl, you will end up with an Alpine image just containing curl. But if you do cmd.cat slash netstat slash tcp dump slash ip slash if config slash ping, it will automatically install all those tools for you and um, hand it out to you. So really nice for debugging. So you don't have to uh, come up with an image and install tools on your own. Okay, so we made it to the end. Um, a few important things is, um, as you've seen, this, the, the features that I've, that I've shown you, um, they cover about two years of uh, features in the Docker CLI. So um, even though Docker has, focused, uh, has tried to focus on, on the uh, enterprise business, uh, it has, Docker has never stopped focusing on developers. It has always brought new features uh, into the Docker CLI that uh, help developers and uh, ops people like me um, to improve images, to improve builds, and to improve uh, running all that stuff. And most of the things that we currently see um, happening um, on the Docker side of the CLI and uh, Docker engine is enabled by the build kit project. And there's even more exciting stuff that I was not able to, to share with you, like um, using Kubernetes as the, the base for running build kit instances uh, used for building Docker images, which is absolutely amazing. Um, I've tested this out today, but um, there was no way to get this in uh, today's talk. Um, yeah, sorry for that. And, and as always, that's, I think it's very important to note is that uh, Docker has uh, inspired an enormously active community um, with which provides new tools and uh, shares new ideas. So there's a lot of stuff happening. Um, yeah, so uh, be sure that uh, Docker has never lost the focus on developers. And um, I think that's actually proven by all the features that I've demonstrated. So uh, thanks a lot for joining. Thanks for all your questions. Uh, we did it just on time. Um, so you can either um, copy the QR code from this slide or you can wait um, for the blog post um, to appear on the, on the Docker blog. I'll uh, give my best to get this up very quickly so you get uh, the video, the links to the slides, link to the demos, and everything you need. Thanks and a lot. in terms of sending the link of the recorded talk, if you registered and I have your email, I can send you the link. If you did not register and you just joined Zoom, you will just have to look out on the Docker blog and Docker Twitter uh, account to get the links to uh, all the content from today. So thank you, everyone. I really appreciate all the questions. And Nicholas, thank you so much. This was amazing. Um, check out the virtual meetup group on events.docker.com or meetup.com to hear this, check out our next meetup as well. And if you join those groups, you'll get automatically emailed when a new event is posted. Uh, thank you. Bye, all.